everybody, it is Kalaxon here. If you guys enjoyed this video, you guys should subscribe, become patrons over on Patreon to support the channel. Remember to ring that notification bell and follow me over on social media. So today, we are going to be doing a Miraculous Ladybug Theory. Now, usually I would edit these and put some clips and put some pictures, but really, there's nothing necessarily, like, deep in this show, like, quotes and stuff that I could show you guys. It's just sort of an idea that I've sort of had. So there will be some images, but we're just gonna, we're just gonna sit down and talk, all right? That's how I like to watch other people's YouTube videos when they're sitting down, they're talking, and they're giving out like the info or the theory and all that stuff. A couple weeks ago, I made a theory about Adrian being a senti monster because of the episode Feast. And in Feast, Master Fu basically shows this image of a Peacock Miraculous holder with seven senti monsters. And so I was thinking, like, what if I told you guys, okay, that some of the Miraculous Ladybug characters are supposed to represent the seven deadly sins? Okay, so I think that it's all tied together. So that image, like the one um, that the peacock holder has with those seven senti monsters, you have basically seven colors, right? There's a gray one, and so I put gray as pride, red as wrath, pink as lust, blue as sloth, violet as gluttony, yellow as greed, and then green as envy. So it really depends on what culture or what chart you're looking at, um, just because I found a lot of variation. Sometimes pride is purple and greed is blue and like all of that stuff. Like everything just sort of like shifts around, right? But my point is, is that these monsters, they could have been any color. Like they could have had stripes, they could have had spots, you know, they could have been multiple different colors at the same time. But instead we have seven monsters who happen to be colorized the same way as the seven deadly sins are like within different colors cultures, right? And I'm thinking, like, this has to be intentional, right? And since some people from, like, myth and legend and history have had miraculouses in the past, I feel like it's highly likely that monsters of myth and legend or, like, in history were also senti monsters, you know? And so what reason would there be to not consider that the monsters of, say, Greek myth, since we brought up Hercules, may also be senti monsters. But now you may be asking, okay, but what does this have to do with the actual miraculous characters, like the actual antagonists? And I was like half asleep this morning, and for some reason I was thinking about this, like, it's one of those weird things where you're awake but you're also not awake, and I was just like... I was sort of like thinking like about how the seven deadly sins could connect to the adults and I kept sort of thinking that over and over again. Uh, and so all this research for this video is like simple like Wikipedia type stuff, okay? I'm not like a, a seven deadly sins scholar. Like this is stuff that's pretty common knowledge right for our understanding of the seven deadly sins but i did want to double check and look at some articles and things like that and so to start right master fu's deadly sin for example could be gluttony right his emotions create a gluttonous senti monster that is hungry for everything and you guys may think like but master fu like you know he's not he's not an antagonist and he's not but he was responsible for the senti monster, right? And he is basically absolved of his, like, seven deadly sin, if you want to call it that, when the monster was gotten rid of by Ladybug and Cat Noir, when they made everything right again. And you guys may also think, well, Master Fu doesn't seem gluttonous, because he's not eating in access. He's eating because he's hungry. And so while I was doing some research, I figured out that there's a way to commit gluttony if you eat too hastily or too soon or at an inappropriate time. So it's not just eating in access, it's also eating when you're not supposed to. And that's what Master Fu was doing. Like basically he was supposed to be fasting and then he, you know, ignored that. And so that would be gluttonous. So he would fall under gluttony. And so other characters that I think may be like the sin embodiments after Master Fu, you have Lila, Gabriel, Natalie, Chloe, Chloe's mom, and Kagami's mom. And so that makes up to be seven. And I include Chloe and Kagami's mom because in Feast, they are two characters who are watching the news. And we also created a theory like how Kagami's mom and her family lineage may have had the dragon miraculous and how Gabriel Gabriel and her may have some sort of business deal or some sort of thing like to help her recover that miraculous that there may be a couple theory ties there and also a tie with Chloe's mom and all that stuff. 
And I think that Lila, Natalie, and Gabriel are like obvious choices. And I included Chloe because I feel like, you know, she's sort of under the lines of Master Fu. Like she's not necessarily like a big antagonist anymore, but she still like represents something. Uh, and so we'll get to that. So basically that's my justification for including all of these characters. And so instead of being gluttonous, right, like Master Fu uh, learns temper temperance, uh, which I like the definition. Uh, that they had on the wiki under like Hinduism and I think this applies to Master Fu and so it says the theological need for self-restraint is also explained as reigning in the damaging effect of one's actions on others as hurting another is hurting oneself because all life is one and so basically it's sort of like you know the damaging effects of one's actions Master Fu's actions cause a senti monster and that ended up hurting people and so he's rectified of that. Now the senti monster can't hurt people anymore. So let's talk about everyone else, shall we? All right, the first and easiest one is Natalie with lust. And not necessarily like the traditional definition, like this is a kid show, you know. Um, but we know how she feels about Gabriel and that she's willing to sort of have this self-destructive attitude for him you know what I mean and it's not wrong to do anything for the person that you love we see Adrian doing that uh you know as he spends months trying to defend Ladybug but the way that Natalie is doing it is toxic compared to that and you know you may think that Adrian Natalie and Gabriel are all sort of doing the same thing because they'll do whatever it takes but Adrian is really able to step back and see eventually like this isn't working you know I need to stop whereas Natalie she is a sort of self-destructive where she'll just continue to put her life at risk and not take a step back. And I think if Natalie in the future changes the plan and maybe like tries to get Gabriel to take a different approach, that would sort of be interesting. Like she, this would help her escape the vice if you want to call it that. You know what I mean? Because instead of blindly like following and self-destructing for the man that she loves, like I feel like instead she could try to do what's best for him because sometimes what's best for someone is not necessarily what that person wants and so I feel like to bend the definition of chastity a little bit because you guys are kind of seeing what I'm doing like master Fu had a sin it turned into a virtue if lust is a sin chastity is the equivalent and like let's just say that being chased in this case would be her stopping and her sort of taking a step back the second easiest one to explain is Lila as wrath okay Lila has the most anger and wrath out of any character that we've seen before and doing my research basically on the wikipedia it said that like anger is basically neutral but it becomes a sin of wrath when it's directed against an innocent person um or when you desire basically excessive punishment and i feel like this basically is describing like lila's feelings towards marinette and towards hating ladybug because they are like innocent parties and they don't sort of deserve this but she's doing it anyway and so those characters like really natalie and Lila, they are cut and dry. Like, they're the easiest one to explain. But as we keep going down, it was harder to place everyone. I still think that everything I picked is valid, though. But if you guys have a different sort of lineup, I'd like to see that. Um, for Chloe, I feel like it was hard because I feel like Chloe's attitude is changing. But here's my argument, okay? I think that Chloe is supposed to be envy. I think, to an extent, like, somewhere deep down, she is jealous. I think that she hated Marinette in a sense, because everyone liked her, right? And, you know, Marinette has loving parents, and that's sort of the opposite of her own neglectful mother, like Chloe's neglectful mother, right? And so I feel like she's jealous of Ladybug, and then we see that she wants to be Ladybug in these other episodes, right? I feel like that Chloe is just jealous of people because of her, I guess, low self-esteem because of her upbringing. I don't think that's too outrageous to say. I think that that's just true, uh, that Chloe is envious of the others around her. And that's why she's so mean. It's like an insecurity thing. And so I feel like the opposite is sort of, you know, being kind. Like instead of being envious, being kind to people. And you see, you know, Chloe being kind to others. Like she's getting there, right? Like she's never going to fully change. But we see her protect Sabrina, be kinder to her classmates, try to calm people down like with the Akuma and stuff like that. Um, and so I think to an extent, right, b again, being jealous of others comes from your own lack in life and your own insecurity. And when Chloe sort of, um, you know, finds, I guess, her own, like, internal happiness, like, she fills that lack that she has in herself, then, you know, it's sort of like a learn to love yourself thing. Then she'll get better. 
Um, I think that when it comes to Chloe's mom, I think her mom best fits into sloth. And so I looked it up again. So sloth can be defined as sloth is a sin of omitting responsibilities. And the wiki actually uses an example of a son omitting the responsibility to his father. And so that sort of makes me think of like the other way around, like Chloe's mom omitting the responsibility that she has to her daughter, if that makes sense. Like Chloe's mom has a very poor relationship with Chloe. Chloe's mom is neglectful of Chloe. Like I think some stretching is required to make this work, but in a sense, it still is valid. I don't think that Chloe's mom is gonna change anytime soon. Like maybe with the season three finale, but like it seemed like she was gonna change in season two. And then nothing got better. And even on the miraculous Instagram, you see like, oh, I'm going with my mom to Paris. But then Chloe's like, oh, well, my Paris plans are canceled. And she's wearing the sunglasses. Like, she's just really sad about it. Like, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so obviously things have just not changed. And so I didn't do like, oh, well, the equivalent of sloth, like the opposite is this, because I don't think that that's changing anytime soon. Uh, I don't think that it's going to turn from vice to virtue because there still has to be antagonists in the show. It's the same reason I think why Lila isn't um, gonna change and I didn't talk about the opposite of wrath. But anyway, I think Kagami's mom fits into greed. And so this may surprise a lot of people because Kagami's mom doesn't come off as greedy and I think she can fit into pride. But pride needs to be reserved for the big bad, which is Gabriel. That Like that's traditionally how it sort of goes, right? So we're gonna try to make greed work, okay? And I think that it only really works in the working theory we have that Kagami is somehow working with Gabriel and doing these deals to recover the dragon miraculous, which used to be in her family, but like after the 200 years ago incident, it was like taken away from her family, uh, you know, by Master Fu, or basically like maybe they brought it back. Cause I don't really know. We don't really know how the guardian stuff works like we don't know if the superheroes got to keep them like I'm under the impression that they did and that there were some like loose miraculous boxes like in the temple you know what I mean like just being stored there for safekeeping I doubt that they would have to go to Tibet every time and bring them back you know what I mean especially if they were like like to use an example again like the Hercules had a miraculous Joan of Arc had a miraculous like that's a long time to just walk back over you know what I'm saying and so I feel like some of the miraculouses were in the box like probably in the boxes but then some of them weren't and so it's possible that Master Fu was like, hey, Kagami's grandmother, um, I'm gonna need that back <laughs> to complete the miracle box. And he just sort of grabbed the ones that were out in the world, um, if that makes sense. I don't know. I don't know how they give them out. I don't know their process. For Gabriel, of course, we have pride, right? And it is identified as dangerously corrupt selfishness, putting one's own desires, urges, and wants, and whims before the welfare of other people, which, yeah, that's Gabriel. That sounds like Gabriel, all right? Like, put entirety of Paris at risk on the daily because he wants to bring back his wife, which is a gray area f for selfishness, right? And I think that it will be selfish depending on how Emily got to this state in the first place. Because let's just say, for the sake of argument, that the senti monster thing <laughs> It's true, right? Let's just say, because you guys will be like, but Cal, why do we have to, like, you'll understand. So the reason I'm saying that is if because Emily made Adrian the senti monster, she is in the coma, you could argue that her creating an Adrian senti monster was an act of selfishness. And so those are the consequences of her actions and Gabriel wanting to bring her back is still selfish. I still think that Gabriel has a lot of selfish in him. I think that he has a lot of pride. So I think that this does work, but you guys understand what I mean? Like if they misused the miraculous in the first place, the peacock one, and that's how Emily got like this, it's sort of like, well, those are just sort of the consequences of your actions. And so, yeah, then it is selfish. Um, you know what I mean? Like she obviously, like if she was just sick, Right? Like if she was just like in a coma, like that would be sort of a different story because you don't control if you get sick. But if it was a direct cause of something they did, I think that that's worse. So what does this all mean, right? Like if all the antagonists represent the seven deadly sins, what is the next course of action? What does this mean? I think that there is rehabilitation, right? We talked about that with Master Fu and with Chloe and whatever um, to make their vices into a virtue. But in terms of the actual show, 
I don't know. Like, I don't know if this was intentional. I'm not sure, like, what this means for the show. I don't think that they're gonna go down, like, a Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood type situation and actually, like, they're not actually the seven deadly sins. They just sort of represent them. I don't think that they're gonna, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I think it's an interesting theory and comparison, but in terms of the actual impact it'll have on the show, I have no idea. Like, it's just sort of one of those things that you draw a parallel to and you think, oh, that's really cool and interesting writing, but they're not gonna outright state, like, Lila's the pure embodiment of wrath. Like, they're never gonna go there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I don't know how useful this theory is compared to Adrian being a senti monster, but I still wanted to make it. I still thought it was fun. So if you guys enjoyed this, remember to subscribe, become patrons over on Patreon to support the channel, ring that notification bell, and follow me on social media, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye! Thank you for watching, and thank you to our wonderful patrons over on Patreon who support the channel. Their names will scroll through now.